But the whole front end of the game was always the bit we forgot to do because we used to always play it off the command line on these unit boxes. Um, I remember kind of like we were going, you know, it was getting close to the game being finished and things, so, you know, where's, where's, where's all the front end? Where's all the wrapper for it? This is actually the second attempt we had on the front end. There was another attempt which was completely unusable. I remember not even being able to ask was that? I liked it. It just had a very, very bad interface. It was all thrown together and just ad hoc. Uh, it's like mission. We again, you know, there's little screenshots of each of the, of the levels, and as you unlock the game, these appear. So that was quite nice. They so had this kind of structure where you can see how many levels are going to be, how often they're. Um, also, in retrospect, 20 levels was insane. <laughs> um, it's way more than you would normally get. Uh, what if we felt compelled to put in 20? Really, to push for 20 just because of the size of this grid in the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and not all of them had the same amount of attention spent on them. No. Certainly, the, I mean, looking through the levels, the, some of the low, low parts of the levels are um, having to reuse the surface of Seven Iron twice because that's kind of thinly disguised and not really terribly well disguised. The streets level was always a problematic thing. We, it was an exterior and it had this tank driving, which was an iconic thing from the film, so the tank kind of had to happen, or there was a, a kind of um, a rock that he placed on their own backs. But Mark, Mark did a great job of, of doing this fake tank at the last minute. Yeah, that's true. And, and that was, because any compiling the code or checking stuff, you, would, you could only run, it was type G7, and this happened. And, 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 and that was it for, forever. And, and everything was tested out on this level. The arrow was slightly higher, <laughs> most, most of the time. Um, so this level is a very good kind of encapsulation of the game. I'll, 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 you might need to talk when I'm playing long, but I'll screw up. Yeah, um, so you know, we, we only really had one level, for a long, long time, we only really had one level in engine. And it was this one. Um, you know, it's a, le it's a level that I consider, as, um, you know, Dave considers um, one of the finest of the game. It's a very small area. There's, there's very little space used. Um, I'm going to have to start again. Yeah, it, I said I think things have gone interestingly wrong. You see, so there, so there the, the game is incredibly unforgiving. Well, you have I, let, I let that guy get to the alarm, and now if I run around, you can see people are going to be shooting me. So, you know, this kind of difficulty would be pretty much unacceptable in any kind of <laughs> concert. <laughs> That's Robin Beanland uh, composed some of the music for the game. So, again, the game's interesting when you die. That's good. So when, when, when you die, a couple of things happen. One is the, obviously the, the red blood thing, which, which was a thing which we're very keen to have because very iconic bond. Also, there's the last vestige of what Martin was saying about having the motion captured first person head there. Because when you die, the game runs the animation for a camera dropping from the head position from one of the death, death animations. So that's quite effective. And it's also, it's a very, you know, for me, that was always one of the very kind of involving and visceral things about the game was when you die, it just doesn't say game over, you have this horrible moment where your hand goes down and your, your head lurches forward. Um, again, so the <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I think there's someone waiting and they'll surprise you later after you decide they're definitely not there. Or maybe it's the kind of obscure boat. <laughs> Oh. Um, yeah, and then this level has this kind of mechanic where you have to allow her to come out and then she's going to do this and run these animations which at the time were, were quite exciting. But then she opens the door for you to let you through and then you, you go forward and you, you re rejoin her later. But, I mean, that was... All of this kind of stuff was pushing what the AI scripting was capable of. And one of, one of the reasons a lot of this stuff got done, to the standard it got done, I think it was down to the size of the team and the, the environment we worked in, which was a few small offices and people were mostly sitting on top of each other. And it was a very, Martin and I just talked about this last night, there was a very tight coupling between feature requests and code going in and bugs being fixed. 
mean, I used to sit and try and set things up, get stuck, couldn't do something. I would go and say to Mark, you know, I can't do this. Is there some way around it? He would usually say, well, no, there isn't, but um, I'll, I'll have a look at it. And then a couple of days later, he would have added some features to the AI, which I could, I could then use. And there was a lot of little iterations and stuff like that. The other thing as well was that we kept the game, the game ran playably through all of development. And I think that was really important because we were continually, you know, if, if it crashed and fell over, I could have someone, Martin or Mark or, or, or Steve, would look at the stack trace and try and work out what had happened quite quickly. Uh, again, the trigger is I have to go back to see her, and uh, she was coming over the door. Actually, I don't know what she did. Let's switch on some of the cheeks. Mm. That's a good idea. This is another interesting one. The, the interface in our uh, the interface in the game for selecting things that aren't guns is really difficult to use. Uh, it's kind of a, co a consequence of the limited number of buttons and stuff on, on, on the controller. But it was certainly something we didn't we didn't really think about too much until we needed to put all these extra gadgets and stuff in. Um, so I'll show you a level which has got gadgets. On. Uh, no, bunker is a good one to do. This is probably the best stealth, best stealth level of the game. Um, let me go back to cheat. Okay, so these are cheats. And this was another thing which was unusual at the time was putting all of these cheats in. Some of which are, are quite lame. Some of which are quite good. Oh, no, lame. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I seem to remember um, standing with Steve trying to come up with. Very much. There are no shortcuts to get into the levels. I mean, if you play it on, on, on easy, it's probably you know it's probably about a few hours of gameplay to actually get through to, 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 to unlock things. So it, it dates from a, a much more unforgiving time. Cradle. The cradle was a level. I remember when we were up against. We, we never really knew when the last deadline for finishing the game was. I remember the cradle was a level which was very troublesome because. If you look at it, if you built this whole thing from polygons, this whole big antenna cradle, it would be really expensive. And in fact, the first version of it was built in two polygons. And I never ran it any more than about two frames per second. So it all had to be, it was Christmas when the car came in and, and, and we built the whole thing. 